Hi, podcast listeners. My name is Madison Hopkins, and this is Modern Ways. Modern Ways is a guide to eco-friendly homes. And on this podcast, I combine sustainability and real estate for people who want to change their home environment. In each episode, my guests and I empower you with fundamental knowledge so you can create your eco-friendly home and thus change the world around you. Thanks for tuning in today. I really appreciate you being here and hope you learned something new. So let's hop on in to the modern ways of eco-friendly homes. On today's episode, we have Luciano Gomez. Luciano owns his own consulting firm, LG Consulting, which functions as a type of solar brokerage, which he is going to tell us about. He has a bachelor's degree in business from Northwood University in West Palm Beach, Florida, and grew up on a beautiful mountain farm in the mountains near Medellin, Colombia. Lucho, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Maddie. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. So let's start with uh, growing up in Medellin, Colombia. So you lived very close to nature until you were nine years old, and that I know has greatly shaped your values. And then you also graduated college with a degree in business and have successful entrepreneurial undertakings. So how do these two sides of yourself work together in your current position? Uh, I'd like to start with that. Right. Yeah, I have have an interesting mix of nature and wildlife conservation um, principles and I guess just love for wildlife within me, as well as a lot of uh, business savvy and um, education in sales, the business world. Um, You could even call it it, uh, capitalism, if you will. Um, So it's been an interesting uh, journey, I guess, learning how to marry my passions and my love with my education and um, what society has told us the way we're meant to grow up and behave, I guess. So just to give you a little bit of background, like you mentioned, I grew up in the mountains of a town called El Retiro, Colombia, which is near the big city of Medellin. And that's where I really um, developed my love of wildlife and nature and, and wildlife conservation. Um, you know, growing up on out in, in a big farm in the mountains, you spent all of your days outside um, walking through the woods, through creeks and rivers. I had uh, about five or six dogs, which were like my pack, my, my friends, my protectors, who I, I shared a lot of, of time with and, and space. And, um, you know, I guess that's where I really realized that we are just another animal living with a bunch of other different types of animals. And um, just because we're a little bit smarter doesn't mean we're better. Um, Of course, all of this I wouldn't come to realize until later, but my beginnings did shape a a lot of that. Um, Eventually, you know, for for the the situation in in Colombia started getting a little bit violent, and uh, we had a group of terrorists called the guerrilla which were demanding things from the government and they were kidnapping people um, as as a way of that was their warfare. They would kidnap wealthy people and hold them for ransom and that's how they would fund themselves. So our extended family, uh, uh, some uncles and an aunt of mine were kidnapped and my father said, okay, we're going to move to to the United States. We got to get out of here. So he moved us to Auburn, Alabama, where I started fourth grade. That was about nine years old, started fourth grade there stayed in Auburn until we I completed middle school, so about five years. And then from there, we went to Lexington, Kentucky, where I did high school, started college there at University of Kentucky. And um, for my last two years, I transferred to Northwood University in West Palm Beach, a business school. I was I did very well early on in, in Kentucky. I actually started as a, as a pre-vet major, but I, I did well in, in the business classes in the um, business internships and things like that. So I pivoted over to from pre-veterinary medicine to business management following the, the American dream type of route where you go to college, you get a good job, you get a secure and safe salary, and then you retire. Um, very quickly, I learned that I, I was a little bit, I didn't like to work for anyone. And I don't say that um, in in a bad way, I guess the best way I can explain that is that I very much had my own agenda. So I started looking for ways to where I could uh, do my own thing while still following this safe route of getting, going to college and getting a good job and being able to retire safely. Um, And I realized that you really couldn't, couldn't have the two. So that's everything I'm telling you now is kind of led me to where I am today. Um, 
you know, starting with my my education in in the wilderness, in the in the wild, in the mountains of Colombia, then my United States education in school and college, and then um, learning a little bit about the business world and how all that can relate, and how I could really grow my own dream rather than just work for another large company growing somebody else's dream. Um, so once you know, once I graduated college uh, during my last two years of college, I actually had done a, an internship with a couple of serial entrepreneurs and they were starting a new business and they wanted me to intern for them uh, during my junior summer and we did and the 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 company didn't work out but we clicked very well so when I went back to finish my senior year we were brainstorming on different companies and and how we can start our own business that you know that that would work you know um, so I found out that these serial entrepreneurs had a previous business in retention and enrollment for colleges and universities, and they were very successful with it, and their non-compete after they had sold that business was now over. So we decided we would start a software business surrounding social-emotional learning and, um, uh, again, helping kids. Well, actually, it didn't even start with SEL. It started helping colleges enroll and retain students. It's very similar to the last business that they had sold, but quickly that turned into feeding, using software, using um the internet to feed students good information on how to best stay in school and stay in college and finish all the way to graduation and how to pick the right college that was best for them. And then that really translated into tips and wellness and health and overall um, social emotional learning advice and tips and modules for the kindergarten through 12th grade. So the reason I'm telling you that part is because that experience in the public education world when we started selling our software to kindergarten through 12th grade schools opened my eyes to to show me how bad the public education situation is in America. Uh, although it's still better than, than most countries, I'm, I will admit that, um, there's lots of rooms for improvement. So one, when Evolution Labs, the software company that we started, was up and running and doing its own thing, and I started looking for other things, other ways to, to fulfill my, my time and my needs, and that you know six, seven-year-old kid that was always in the back of my head um, telling me to get back to nature, I decided to find a way to mix um, wildlife conservation with education and then with technology and innovation to help improve processes and procedures to help us live in a more symbiotic way with the natural world. Um, so now we can get into what, what we're really here talking about, which is renewable energy and solar. All those stories that I just told you in the past led me to leave Evolution Labs at, at one point uh, and search for a company that was helping spread renewable energy. So I found one of the largest, uh, private, the largest privately held um, solar company in the country, and I started working for them uh, for almost a year. I worked for them. And I, that's where I learned all the ins and outs of solar energy, of um, net metering, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, Before we get too far into the solar part of it, I really appreciate you sharing that part of yourself with us, um, your passion for education and, and how one small piece led to a whole larger piece of the puzzle, which it, and now you, you've taken that journey and gone even deeper into it, it sounds. Um, but I loved hearing about the social education. What did you call it? The social? Social emotional learning. There it is. Social emotional learning. That was really nice to hear about. Good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you like it. And it's, uh, it's so crucial. I, I love what Evolution Labs does and the way that they deploy these easy to learn modules to kids anywhere from first grade to 12th grade. And we even have college programs and, and adult learning programs as well. Um, because unfortunately, in, in, and you, I'm sure you know this already, but the, the public education world, the way it works right now is uh, we're preparing kids to take tests and to get good grades um, because that's how the schools get the, the, the best funding. Um, we're not really preparing them for all the issues that they're dealing with in today's landscape. So that software program that we did has, is really focused on the 300, it's called Suite 360, and it's really focused on the 600, 360 degrees of, of the child, of the, of the, the student that we're trying to teach, you know, help them become a confident, competent, healthy human being to where they'll be an asset to their classroom, an asset to their friends and, and their community. So um, if any mom or dad's out there listening, they'll maybe appreciate learning about that. 
as well. Yeah, definitely. Even though it's not what we're here to talk about, uh, let me just say social emotional learning is crucial to any child's upbringing. I'm really glad you had that experience and that it's led you into something that's a bit more yours. So yeah, why don't you keep telling us about um, LG Consulting and what exactly um, what exactly does it mean to be a solar brokerage firm? Because you've told me that once before when we spoke that you're like, yeah, it's kind of a solar brokerage firm. So what exactly does that mean? Um, what do you do with LG Consulting? Right. So that's that's the name of the, when I left Evolution Labs and I decided that the large company I was working for didn't represent my values in the solar world. And when I say that, I just mean once a company, what I've noticed is once a solar company gets very large, even if they don't go public, their the customer experience takes a side seat to their profits. So a lot of customers were uh, post-installation, pre-installation, they were amazing. Post-installation, a lot of customers were having a lot of complaints about the company not really helping them or, or hand-holding them through some processes or or just simple things that I didn't want to put my name behind anymore. So a few months ago, it was really the perfect time to separate myself from the large company that I was working with. And I really started creating some degrees of separation when the whole pandemic hit. And when the whole pandemic hit, I wasn't doing as much work for them at the time. And they decided to lay off all of their workers, uh, you know, aside from their top managers in each state. So that worked out great. I decided it was the perfect time to really launch this company that I had been kind of dreaming up of for the past months and even years, I would say. And I just didn't know what to, I, at the time, I didn't know what to call it because there were so many different industries and worlds that I wanted to, to eventually jump into. So I just called it My Name Consulting, LGC, LG Consulting. And our mission is to identify and represent the best products, services, and people that bring the most benefit to the future of my clients, our communities, and our planet. Our three founding pillars are education, innovation, and conservation. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of, of what our goal is and, and, and what our mission is, but, but the way that I really felt like we could best start making an impact was renewable energy and the path of least resistance within the world of renewable energy is solar energy we have technology now that's been created and evolved by nasa and top technology companies all over the world that is now able to harness our largest natural resource which is the sun and now we're able to harness that power from from this amazing um, celestial being, which is uh, you know our very own star, the sun, and we can use it to 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 run our lives, to power our refrigerators, our air conditioning, our, our keep our electronics on, be able to record this uh, podcast that we're doing. All of this can be done with the sun, you know. Prior to that, we really didn't have that many ways of creating energy aside from digging into the earth, which we know is very, very detrimental as, as far as coal mining, not only to the earth, but, you know, when you're, you know, there's tons of different documentaries and, and, and articles you can look up about the communities that are coal mining communities who all, all their members end up dying of some sort of cancer or black lung or emphysema. So we knew that you know, it doesn't doesn't take any degree in envir environmental science, or or you don't have to be a a, a passionate wildlife uh, conservationist to know that that wasn't the right way. So then, nuclear is another option, but the when it's done well, it, it it is a great source of power, and there is very little, if any, waste to it. But it's at the mercy of human error. If there's one thing I've learned about human error, it's that it's it's 100% going to happen in anything you do. You know, there are going to be human errors. So regardless of the, the protocols and the procedures and, and the safety measures that we put in press place when it comes to nu nuclear power, the downside of a human error, the downside of, of, of messing up, let's say, is catastrophic. And it, to me, it does not, it, it did not, it's not worth me putting my resources and my company into exploring nuclear energy yet. Whereas solar is and renewable energy and, and, and uh, wind hydroelectric, wind energy is feasible. You know, I'm not going to say it's cheap right now, although it is the prices are dropping for all of that, but it's feasible, it's safe, and it's completely clean to create the energy. Now, 
there are, we can talk about later on about how the processes to create solar panels or to create wind farms could be improved and they could be made more environmentally friendly. But when we compare it to the alternatives like nuclear power and fossil fuels, it just doesn't compare. It's a much, much better source of energy. So that's how we dove. That's why I decided to take LGC into into the solar world. Okay, great. So I just want to ask you a couple questions about that. So from a homeowner's perspective, why why should they get solar? And what sort of company should they look for when choosing a solar installation company? What should they look for? What should they stay away from? And I know you go through that sort of process when you when you launched your solar side of LG Consulting. So Right. So for a homeowner that's looking to, to get solar, the very, very first thing that I recommend is do a little bit of research on what solar is, how it works on your home, how it's able to power your house, and how it's able to not only you know help the environment, but save you money on your electricity bill. There's actually a really um, good video that maybe you could put a link up on your site if you want to. If you want, we could play the audio now, or if you want, I can just explain it. How about I play it first, <laughs> and then you can explain it? Perfect. Okay. So here is the little video. It's called Florida Solar Pitch by Paul Dilio, and I'm going to have a link to this in the show notes. And the best part is that if you create your own energy, you won't have to pay anybody else for it. The sun won't charge you. Do you know how this can be done? Installing your own rooftop solar system. They're made out of photovoltaic cells that converts photons from the sun to electric current. But we won't bore you with all the techie stuff. The important thing to know is that free energy from the sun is able to power your whole house. During the day, the energy the solar panels produce, but don't use, is sent onto the electric grid. And so, you can get credits from your electric company. These credits can be used at night when the sun goes down. The energy your system produces will be enough to run your house 24-7 without having to pay your electric company. You will be the sole owner of your rooftop solar system. After a few years, when your system is fully paid, you'll be done with paying bills related to electric power. But that's not all. You can get financing incentives from the government. This is a no-brainer. Why not save in energy bills, become energy independent, increase the price of your home, and help the environment? So so that kind of sums it up. You know, that tells you how that basically if you get a solar... Now the, the government has incentives in place to where you can get a solar system at your home at no upfront cost. It replaces your current utility bill and it actually lowers your current utility bill. And while the utility bill, you know, continue, continues rising with inflation, you know, for the next however many years, your solar bill gets locked down because there's a, a solar loan company, let's call them, that is paying for your system and then you're just paying them off on a monthly basis for the next, you know, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, depending how low or high you want your monthly payment to be. So that's great news, right? So for, for homeowners, that video tells you that, look, there is a way that you can get all of the energy that you're currently using right now in your home and make it completely solar, you know, clean energy, renewable energy. And you don't have to shell out, you know, $50,000, $60,000, $80,000 for a big system to do it like you would have had to do in the past before net metering became available. So again, the first thing for a homeowner to really learn about solar is find out the logistics of exactly how solar works. So how does solar work? The panels go on top of your house and they, they use a, a photovoltaic system, which simply means they're creating energy from the light that is hitting the panels. The energy that they are creating is direct current. So in order to be able to use it in the home, we use in, in homes or schools or any building, we use alternate current. So an extra piece of equipment is required uh, aside from just the panel called an inverter. An inverter will convert direct current to alternate current so that we can use it in the home. The In the past, company used would string up all the panels together and they would use one large central inverter where they would get all of the electricity, all of the direct current coming from your system, run it through this one big inverter box, and then, you know, power your home. That is an antiquated system and that is the first red flag for homeowners when they're shopping for 
solar energy for a solar system. Make sure you never work with a company that uses central inverters or string inverters because they string all the panels up. So sometimes they're called string inverters. And make sure you're always working with a company that is using micro inverters. The micro inverters that I recommend are called uh, actually, the only ones I know of are Enphase inverters, Enphase micro inverters, and Enphase is the company that that creates those. Actually, if you're in, if you play around with the stock market I'll, I'll, at all, Enphase and their ways of creating renewable energy is is growing quite a bit. So that's a company you want to look into. So that's one of the triple crowns of solar. When I say triple crown of solar, it's the top top three equipments. That's something I learned learned at one of the large companies that I used to work for is you always want to have the triple crown of solar. So that means top tier panels, and those are called monocrystalline panels. So there's many different manufacturers of them. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to go with one company of them, but make sure that whatever manufacturer or panel you're using, whether it's Q cells or LGs or Jinko solar, whatever the company is, make sure that they only use monocrystalline panels. There's no reason why any company should be using the old type of panels, which are polycrystalline. Those are the ones that have more of a bluish tint and they're not as efficient. Whereas the monocrystalline panels are also, they look a lot nicer. They're all black on black. You know, sometimes they'll have the 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 grid the the silver grid around it but the the panel itself should be all black and it just when you're looking at it from from on your roof it just looks like a big glass window very sleek very modern so monocrystalline panels and phase microinverters and then the third piece of the triple crown of solar is a railless racking system that means no rail the the my favorite one is made by ecofest and x but i'm sure there's there's others as well so that's what I recommend to homeowners when they're looking into solar. Monocrystalline panels, M-phase microinverters, Ecofast and X-rayless racking system. Now, when once you've got the system all set up and it's been turned on, the electricity is being produced, the microinverters underneath each one of the panels are converting it to uh, alternate current. The system go the the um, energy goes down a neatly laid conduit down the side of your house and into a combiner box that we place next to your meter. Now, currently, most houses have a one-directional meter, which is the meter that reads how much electricity they're using, and that's how the utility companies bill them. Once they get solar, the utility companies will change their meter to a bi-directional meter. This way, we can measure how many kilowatt hours your system is sending back into the grid. So when I say kilowatt hours, that's our way of measuring electricity. So like... Like you would say gallons for gasoline, we say kilowatt hours for electricity. So during the day when your system is producing power, it'll be, if you have enough roof space, it'll produce a lot more energy than your house can consume during the day. Then at night when your system is no longer producing that power, the uh, all the energy all that excess energy that you produced during the day was sent to the grid and the bi-directional meter started recording how much electricity you sent to the grid that day and they build up a bank of kilowatt hours in your name at night when that system's no longer producing power they send back all of that electricity and your your house continues using power it's seamlessly supplemented by the grid only you don't have to pay for it because it comes out of your banked kilowatt hours that process it's called net metering that means that for every one kilowatt hour that you send to the grid your utility company owes you one kilowatt hour. It's a one-to-one ratio. And that's what makes it feasible for homeowners to get solar today because they're not paying for the system and for util- for electricity at night. It's all being produced by your system. You simply redistribute it during the day and then you get it back at night. Now, there are other ways aside from net metering. So if somebody wanted to be completely off of the grid, create their own energy, not use the the utility companies to supplement them at night themselves at night then they would simply want to get some type of battery system tesla powerwall is one of them there's lots of different battery systems um, that are currently being used and they're available they're they're also uh, a little bit pricey so i always recommend starting out with net metering and then eventually getting a battery system if if you so choose but you know, to each their own. Some people want to get the system and the batteries and the batteries right away. So the first tangible Um, step would be go to solar and then have your uh, energy come into your home from the grid, which, and by that you mean from, from nuclear or fossil fuels at night, right? 
Yep. So there's still in net metering the the energy that homeowners are getting at night are still coming from however the utility company gets it, whether they're getting it from a nuclear facility near them or fossil fuels. The energy that your house is being powered with at night does come from those traditional sources. However, it's important to note that you're not being charged for that energy because your house produced so much during the day. If we're at 100% offset, your house produced so much energy during the day that the the grid was able to use that electricity, excess electricity coming from your roof to power other houses in the area. So they're really only giving you back what you already used to help them um, power other houses. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, right. So you have the tangible step of first switching to solar and then mm-hmm. you have your house powered by solar during the day. And then at night, you'll be supplemented with regular fossil fuel energy from the grid, but you're also powering another house more than likely with your so- your excess solar during the day. And then the next tangible step would be to potentially get uh, a, a battery for your own house if that's something that you fully wanted to do. Yep. And there's uh, some homeowners that do that in the first year. Like I said, there's some that do it right away. And then there's some that never do that. You know, there's some that just stay, you know, they've had solar for 10 years and they've never hopped off the grid because th- they don't need to, you know, it's not it's the same thing, really. If if I, I think eventually, as people become more independent of of government and utility companies and, and big corporations like that, most people will want to be on their own battery system. But for someone that doesn't doesn't mind that and they just want to save a couple bucks on their electricity bill, net metering is is what they need. So, is there a type of homeowner that you notice is seeking solar more than others? And by that, I mean. Um, like a first time homeowner, second time, upsizing, downsizing. What have you noticed? Who's seeking solar the most right now? Yeah, that's actually a really, really great question that I often get from a lot of clients. And if you were to look at my client list for the past year of everyone that's gotten solar, it ranges from everywhere from your, you know, the the young couples that are just starting their lives and have their first home and plan on being in their homes for a long time to older couples that just want to save some money on their electricity bill to single parents that are just passionate about renewable energy and realize that now it's possible for them to go solar at no no cost or, or added, I guess, grievance to them. There really is no one type of, of person that is searching for solar now. I guess the one way I could separate if, is the ones who seek us out are because they've heard about the savings associated with solar or because they're passionate about the environment. And then now that the solar industry is such a, a lucrative industry, companies have massive outreach programs where they have uh, phone centers or email outreach or any type of outreach where they're trying to let everyone know that they can save money from solar. And with that, we get all kinds of people, you know, anyone who, who thinks they can save a little bit of money, anyone who cares about the environment. Anyone who is just fed up with the rising costs that are associated with utility companies is now becoming a solar customer. So that, hopefully that kind of answers your question. There is no one type of family that has been looking into getting solar. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a family. That's a very good point. You know, I have customers that are young men and women living on their own, starting out their lives that know, you know have done their research and, and found out this is good for them and they've hopped on. And also I have people that have have never married that are living on their own, some with kids, some without kids. And then also the older gentlemen and, and, and ladies that have also either they've been usually once you get into the older demographics, it's someone has reached out to them, either a family member has told them about the benefits of it, or they've gotten a call or email from a solar company that has told them about the benefits of it. But yes, they're, they're in there as well. Cool. So my next question then would be who qualifies for solar? What are the, well, not who qualifies. Sorry, let me rephrase that. <laughs> question then would be what are the qualifications homeowners need to meet in order to get solar panels? So that's, a, that's another good question. So the first one was, you know, is there a type of person or family that has been looking for, for solar? And the answer is no. You know, any come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And the second question is who qualifies for solar? That That is a little bit more exclusive because 
since first let me say anybody if you have the money and and the cash to pay for a solar system now anybody can get solar on their home but to qualify and and you, and you could still get you know an investment tax credit which we'll talk about in a little bit but to qualify for uh, financing and for this for part of this government incentive you do have to meet certain criteria so the condition of your roof has to be acceptable because once the the solar company puts panels on your roof they'll have to warranty it that any leaks anything else that comes from the panels they'll take care of so they won't approve a roof that is already in bad condition so condition of your roof the direction of your roof is also important because we're in the northern hemisphere in the united states the sun goes east to west across our, the south. You know, we see it on, on, the, on the southern sky. So a south-facing roof is going to be much more efficient than a north-facing roof. Normally this isn't a problem, but if a house has very little south-facing roof or it's covered in trees on that side and there's shade on the, nonstop on the roof, that'll disqualify them from solar as well. We do, for my company, we do offer tree removal, but because, you know, to go along with this whole wildlife conservation uh, mission for any trees that we remove we're sure to plant the same amount of trees in a wildlife preserve or local area or even another part of the homeowner's property for the trees that we've removed for solar so so that's one thing is is so those are two things right there condition of your roof direction of your roof and shading of the roof all three of those things could disqualify you credit is the one that for me at least for my for people i've met with that's been the biggest disqualifier if you're under a 650 uh, credit score most lenders most solar loan companies will not approve you for a solar loan and they will not buy your system so what i do for those homeowners is i connect them with other partners that i have in in the industry that are uh, credit repair partners and so that not only helps the credit company get new customers it helps the homeowner raise their credit and then eventually it'll help them get solar as well so condition of the roof direction of the roof and shading credit taxable income because of the investment tax credit so i'll explain that one in a minute but just remember that you you're, you have to have enough taxable income to be approved for a solar loan well let's hop mm-hmm. into that taxable credit i'm sorry what did you <laughs> taxable income Yep. So why people have to have taxable. I'm sorry, there was one more criteria, which I, I blanked out on, which was usage. So condition of your roof, direction of your roof, shading, credit score, taxable income and usage. You have to use enough electricity for it to be worth it for you to get a solar system. So as far as investment tax credit, this is the way that the government is incentivizing going green, going solar. So from 2016 to 2019, they offered a 30% investment tax credit, which means that they would give homeowners a credit on their taxes for 30% of the total cost of the system. So let's say that a big system, the total cost was $100,000. That homeowner would get a tax credit of $30,000 on their next tax cycle. If the system was $50,000, they would get a tax credit of $15,000. Does that make sense how that works? Yes. Cool. So in 2020, the tax credit went down to 26%. So now any homeowners that get solar now that decided, oh, you know, we're going to wait and see what the, how the landscape changes from 2019 to 2020, now they're getting 4% less. So, so now the tax credit is 26% of the total tax of the system homeowners get in a credit. In 2021, it will go down to 22%. And then currently, the government wants it gone by 2022. So it'll be 0% investment tax credit. And then they said they will add a 10%, which might be in place already. We'll have to look into that. But they say they will keep a 10% commercial investment tax credit. So for commercial companies and and utility companies, if they get solar, they can still get a 10% credit. But as far as residential, it's completely gone in 2022. So that sparks a little bit of urgency for people who are wanting to go solar now at no cost. And it sparks a little bit of urgency for me and other companies who are trying to spread renewable energy as much as possible before the government takes away this, these incentives. So the investment tax credit, let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this I, I, I'm because... It's a whole different subject, but it is important if you're getting solar to understand tax, your tax liability and your tax appetite. Appetite. So if you have, let's say, um, in, 
I'm going to put it in the simplest terms as possible. If I had to pay, let's say, $40,000 in taxes, and I had a $20,000 investment tax credit from a solar system that I got, during the next tax season, instead of paying $40,000 to the government, I would take, I would pay $20,000 and pay that to the government. Then I would take the other $20,000, that was my investment tax credit, and put it into the solar loan. So it doesn't mean that I want to pocket this, although I certainly can and my monthly solar loan would go up, but it means that I'm going to take that investment tax credit and use it as the down payment for my solar system. So it literally comes out of no money out of pocket for me because I'm taking it out of the money that I would have had to pay in taxes, and now I'm just putting it as the down payment into this solar loan. Now, we know that, let's say, I want to get a solar system in July. I just paid taxes, so I'm not going to have that investment tax credit to be able to give to the solar loan company, right? So the solar loan companies give you 18 months, that's two ta tax cycles, to, to be able to repay that, that down payment. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, that's a, a nice long time. Yeah, so they got plenty of time to be able to claim the tax credit from the government and put it over into the loan company. Like I said, some people decide they just want to keep the tax credit. Like the, let's say they have a, a smaller system, they got $8,000 investment tax credit, and instead of paying that in their down payment to the loan, they're just going to want to go on a trip or, or I don't know, buy something else or just pocket it. That's fine as long as they understand that their monthly loan payment is going to go up. Their monthly loan payment will go up to reflect that there was no down payment within those first 18 months. Makes sense? Yeah, that does. That seems pretty fair too. So what other cost do customers need to know about that the tax credit seems like a very big rebate? What about sort of like insurance? Yeah, that's, that's, that's insurance is a great point because that's probably the ones that companies forget to mention the most when homeowners are going solar. You know, it can be another little obstacle to, to them signing up for the system and, and saying yes. So sometimes they'll either omit it or the large companies during their sales training will minimize that, you know, won't tell their reps, won't be as adamant to their reps about how much they have to mention that. So that's another thing that I prepare homeowners for when I when I first meet with them. Your insurance will go up. You know, you're putting a anywhere from a twenty thousand dollar system to a hundred thousand dollar system on the phone on your home, and your homeowner insurance will go up. Of course, the amount that it goes up is maybe you know two hundred a year, a hundred dollars a year for really really like I've had some horse farms where they have a lot of personal liability risk, so their insurance with a big system might go up seven hundred dollars a year, but it's a small amount to pay in comparison to the, the, the savings that are associated with going solar. But, you know, it's important that the customer knows that, yes, their homeowner's insurance is going to go up because they will be protecting a, a system that is on their home. And all utility companies that I've worked with so far require at least a $1 million um, policy, a $1 million personal liability coverage. And that's what makes the insurance go up. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you for covering that. That seems like a very important piece uh, that people need mm -hmm. to know about. And I remember learning not too long ago that solar panels actually help protect roofs in Colorado, where I am, against hail because they're mm -hmm. so strong um, and well-built that it actually ends up protecting your roof in a hailstorm. So Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Honestly, I, I hadn't heard of that until you just now mentioned it but that makes sense you know that it is an extra layer of protection on your roof and, and there's lots of little benefits like that that people don't think of you know one of them is is a subconscious one where what I've noticed is that all my clients I, I shouldn't say all but for the most part they are become way more conscious about the energy that they're using after going solar than before you know before they're just paying for it somebody else is producing it and they just pay the bill every month and then after they get solar they're creating their own power and they don't want to go over what they're producing because then they have to pay the the utility companies for any extra energy that the system doesn't produce so they're way more conscious about turning off the lights and and not leaving the tv on not leaving music playing when they're not home things like that another thing that that another little kind of side effect of solar is that in the summer your your house is using 
less electricity. Again, everything I'm telling you, by the way, Maddie, is all based on data that I've gathered through my time in, in renewable energy and, and putting up solar systems and staying in touch with customers long after they, they've got them. None of this is science data. So uh, let me just put that out there that I'm by no means do I classify myself as an expert in any of this. I just have a passion for it and I have some knowledge on it that I want to share with everyone. And you have experience in it. And I have a lot of experience in it. So again, just want to put that out there in case anyone says, oh, well, I used more energy after. I think I'm going to sue this Lucho kid who told me I would use less. So as far as uh, other little benefits that come from your solar system, once you're on the roof, your house is using less energy to keep itself cool in the summer because the hottest part of any house is the roof, right? That, that's constantly getting hit by the sun's rays. That heat absorbs into the attic. That's the second hard, hottest part of any house is the inside of the attic. And everyone knows that everyone's had to crawl up in the attic or have someone had to crawl up in the attic for to grab something for whatever reasons. You know, it's hot and you can't breathe up there. All that heat is being absorbed down into the house and then your AC is kicking on to try to keep your house cool. Once that system is covering all of your roof or the most part of your roof, that heat isn't hitting the roof anymore. It's being... Uh, turned into energy by your solar system. So let's say you keep your house, you kept your house at 73 degrees last year during the day. This year after you have solar, you're still keeping it at 73 degrees, but your house is working less hard to, to stay cool. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that. Um, but that's really why the solar panels are on the roof is because it's, I mean, I knew it absorbed the most sunlight. It's high off the ground. You know, you're not really in the line of trees, mostly or that can be adjusted, but yeah, the heat that it produces and then absorbs versus now it's absorbing and turning into energy, that actually is really something cool to think about, that it's not heating your attic, it's not heating your upstairs. Nice. Right, exactly. And also another thing to, to think about is that you do, some states are more, let's call it solar friendly than others, right? So in New Jersey, you don't even have to own your solar system because there's companies that will pay for the solar system and they'll own the system and you're basically leasing power from them. So let's say that you were getting your electricity at uh, 12 cents a watt from this isn't accurate, by the way, but let's say that they're, that you're you're getting your electricity from for, from a utility company for uh, twelve cents a, a kilowatt hour, not a watt, a kilowatt hour, twelve cents a kilowatt hour. Then a company might buy a solar system, and because they have the cash, they have the capital to buy a solar system and put it on your roof, and they'll they'll finance it, they'll pay for it, but they'll own it, and then they'll charge you for the electricity you consume at let's say eight cents per kilowatt hour as opposed to the 12 cents that you were getting charged from the utility company. States that allow solar renewable energy credits, SRECs, are the only states that can have those models because they're getting, not only are they getting the money that they're charging the homeowner to lease the power coming from their system, but also they're getting solar renewable energy credits, which are given to them by the government for every 1,000 kilowatt hours that that system that you own produces, you're getting an SREC, a solar renewable energy credit, which can be sold on the SREC trade, which is similar to a stock market. You just sell solar renewable energy credits. So if a company that has to have a certain amount of renewable energy credits and hasn't met that quota by you know whatever the year is instead of taking a fine from the government for not hitting their quota they'll buy srx from these companies that are producing them on people's uh, roofs and uh, individual homeowners can do that as well so that's what you mentioned the stock market as you knew a little bit about the stocks with uh your srx trading yeah yeah you know there's lots of the the world of solar is kind of like it's kind of like wine, you know, you think it's just it's just a, a, a liquid and, and you drink it and it makes you feel good. And then you realize that there's a whole world of wine and how to make it and different grapes and different techniques and stuff. Solar, you think it's just you're getting renewable energy from the sun and then you go in and there's a whole world of how to produce these panels, how to put them on your home, how to finance them, how to learn uh, about all the different companies that are doing it the right way and doing following their mission, how to protect yourself from the companies that are out to just, you know, capitalize on the opportunity of, of uh, that solar has provided. So it is a whole new world that has taught us quite a bit. So 
We are coming to the closing hour of our podcast episode. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about solar? If you're looking to get solar, if you're looking whether whatever state you might be in, research more than one company. You know, companies are very big about saying they're the only ones that will take care of you well. Companies are very smart about how they position themselves, to, which is it's normal. You know, it's sales. Like any industry, they'll position themselves as they are the savior. They are the ones that are going to be with you forever, and they're the ones that are going to help you, and the only ones that can provide the service that they can provide. That is not true. The world of solar is a very saturated market. There are a lot of companies out there. There are a lot of companies that are not performing Um, to the standard that you would want, but there are many, many, many that are. So definitely research more than one company. Never sign up on the first day. You know, the first time that you meet with someone, every single solar rep is going to tell you today is the only day that I can get you this deal. Today is the only day that I can give you our efficient pricing. Today is, you know, if you sign up today, you'll have plenty of time to think about it later. It's just techniques to try to get sales and reach their monthly quota. When we're talking about something as important as renewable energy, there's no reason why anyone should be rushing you to make a decision. So research with more than one company. Don't sign up on the first day. Look out for the telltale signs of what we call, what I call, what I've personally, you know, coined is the wolves and shepherds of solar. The wolves of solar are these large corporate-based companies that really are just out to to meet shareholder expectations, to 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 raise profits, to 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 skin the pig as much as they can. You want you know they they see you as the pig or the sheep, and they want to take as much meat off of you that one day that they meet with you because they know that they won't have a chance to meet with you again if you talk to another company. Right? That's the wolves of solar. And then you have the shepherds of solar, which are many, many companies that are doing it right. You know, they are, they're taking what we call the, the sheep, which are the people that don't know about solar, and they're educating them into the world of solar. They're telling them how the system works. They're telling them what benefits their companies provide, but more importantly, the benefits that the customer will get and that the planet will get by switching to renewable energy. Those shepherds, I believe, are taking sheep and turning them into shepherds so that then they can, so that the homeowners that previously didn't know about solar can now spread the good news and spread the word about renewable energy and help others convert as well. Whereas the big, large corporate type companies that are just out to get your money, they're just wolves. They're just eating the sheep. And then usually they have the, the, the homeowner that signed up with one of these companies has some sort of issue and they'll never tell their neighbors to get renewable energy because they had a bad experience. So look for the companies that are turning sheep into shepherds, which are shepherds themselves, and avoid the wolves of solar. I think that's the best thing I can leave people with. I love that so much. Sheep into shepherds. Thank you so much for being here today, Lucho. I've definitely learned a lot. I hope our listeners have learned a lot. And I look forward to talking with you again sometime. Thank you so much, Maddie. I'm looking forward to it. Explorers of Modern Ways, thank you so much for tuning in today. You can find more of me on Instagram at Moving with Madison and YouTube Moving with Madison. YouTube is where I post the video recording of each episode so you can watch along if you please. I hope you learned something new today and that helps you take a tangible step towards creating your eco-friendly home.